That is almost a virtual background, Ali. I think you've done so well there. <laughs> I, like I must say they're highly complimentary, both of your backgrounds. <laughs> I've just realised I've got my votive candle back there, but that's because I've got the slow cooker in the other room and it smells. So I thought I'd put on the votive candle as well. That wasn't a, that's not a prop. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to go on mute now. Ali, I've started recording. Well, welcome everyone to this COVID-19 member briefing, RegTech Opportunities in the Crisis. I'm Ali Moore and I'll be moderating this afternoon's discussion. In the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we engage in this session, wherever we might be in Australia, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. As most of you know, the RTA was established in 2017 as a non-profit body to accelerate the adoption of RegTech and create a centre of global excellence. And today it's grown to 150 organisations with an increasingly global remit. This afternoon, we welcome the Assistant Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and Financial Technology, Jane Hume, to tell us more about the government response to the pandemic and the all important recovery efforts. As well, three RegTech firms at different maturity stages will talk about their experiences through this crisis and what their recovery looks like. And finally, we'll finish with the launch of the RTA's two-year strategy. This series is called RegTech Open for Business, and it both supports the community and provides access to resources, tools and leadership, as well as sending a clear message that this is no time to be reducing commitment to regulation and compliance. So just a little bit of housekeeping. As Deborah said before, if everyone could stay on mute, that would be terrific. If you don't, it's gonna get a little bit messy. Uh, that doesn't mean though that you can't contribute to the conversation. We'll take questions from the audience after we've heard from uh, our minister and our three reg techs. So you can submit your questions via the chat function. If you can give me your name and your organization before your question to provide some context, that would be terrific. And I'll do my very best to get to as many of them as possible. As well, the session is being recorded and it will be available to members afterwards. So I'd now like to welcome the Honourable Senator Jane Hume, Assistant Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and Financial Technology. As many of you are well aware, Jane was elected to Parliament in 2016 and before that she held senior positions in the financial services industry. So Senator Hume, hello and, and welcome us, welcome to you. And uh, I'd just like to point out, I did put the fire on so that this is a true fireside chat. I am very impressed with your virtual background, Ali. I'm sure it's not real. <laughs> but, uh, Senator, as the campaign says, RegTech is open for business. So how is the government working to reassure the RegTech community that it supports innovation and early stage business? And I say that against the backdrop of support programs that will help many but won't help all with those who are pre-revenue obviously left out of uh, programs like JobKeeper. Thank you, Ali. That's actually a really good question and an amazingly broad question to begin with. Can I first of all say thanks very much to the RegTech Association for inviting me along today. I think that forum like these, fora like these, are absolutely invaluable to maintain connection between industry and government at this time of social distancing, which sometimes can make, make communication, uh, you know, just that little bit more difficult. So um, I understand that this is a really difficult time for Australian businesses generally. And we know too that startup, um, people in the, those in the startup ecosystem can feel that pressure really acutely. Um, that combination of the um, you know, low availability of, of capital combined with you know, quite short runways in your businesses and also falling demand has forced some, some people in the industry, whether it be reg tech, fintech or startups more broadly, to make some really difficult decisions in the past few weeks, and, and this could continue for some time. But look, yesterday the Treasurer in his speech to the National Press Club said something that really resonated with me, and I, I've, I've, I hope you don't mind, I've written it down because I wanted to make sure that I got it exactly right. But the Treasurer said that unleashing the power of dynamic, innovative and, um, and open markets must be central to the recovery with the private sector leading job creation. And I think that 
should give you some indication of the value that we place in the work that the constituents of the RegTech Association, um, the, the work that you do, why that's so important to us. That's why that the government has taken the unprecedented, and I hate using that word because everybody uses it, but it, it's hard to avoid the unprecedented action to, to protect vulnerable sectors of the economy from the effects of coronavirus with government support that is now totaling $320 billion, which is 16 0.4% of GDP. And that's why I've been working with my ministerial colleagues and also the tax commissioner to ensure that um, as many startups and contractors as possible uh, have uh, eligibility for the $130 billion JobKeeper program. So while initially there was some concern that uh, those in the startup community might miss out. Some changes have been made. Now, they're a little bit technical, so I do, but if you'll allow me a moment to just go through them, Ali. New businesses, high growth businesses, and businesses with a regular turnover are now uh, accommodated within the JobKeeper eligibility step tests for startups. Um, for those new businesses, if you've commenced within the prior 12 months, you qualify for JobKeeper if your turnover has declined by 30% compared to either the average turnover of the life of the business or the average turnover of the prior three months. For high growth businesses, you qualify for JobKeeper if your GST turnover has declined 30% compared to one of three options where um, if, you're, if you've experienced an increase in turnover greater than 50% or more in the last 12 months, 25% or more in the prior six months, or 12.5% in the prior three months. And for businesses with a regular turnover, and I'm not talking about you know, sort of regular seasonal variances, but if you've got an irregular turnover, um, in one quarter of the last 12 months, that is less than half of the turnover in another quarter, you qualify for JobKeeper again if your turnover has declined by 30% compared to the average turnover for the prior 12 months. Now, that is an enormous mouthful and it is quite complicated. That has been published though uh, on the ATO's website. It's also available through the RegTech Association. If you feel that your business may well qualify for JobKeeper, uh, they're probably the two places I would suggest you have a look and see whether you meet one of those criteria. And I should make it clear too that businesses that qualify um, under any one of those criteria, alternative tests, um, even though sometimes multiple tests might apply to them. So, um, you know, the JobKeeper program was put together, it was targeted so that companies whose revenue flows have been impacted by the, uh, the epidemic are able to receive the support that they need um, to keep as many employees as possible in jobs. It's $1,500 a fortnight, as you well know. And for most people, that's equivalent to around 70% of the median wage. Um, that comprehensive set of eligibility criteria have applied from two weeks ago. Uh, and we've also extended the deadline for applying for the uh, initial JobKeeper payment to the 31st of May. So there should be more opportunities available to those in the RegTech sector that are, are feeling the pinch right now. Indeed, you, you did start by by uh, quoting the Treasurer from yesterday and talking about the recovery and unleashing the power of the private sector. So how does that look or what does that look like from a reg tech perspective? How critical is reg tech to the recovery phase from the government's point of view? And indeed, do you have a sense of where you'd like reg tech to have greater traction? Yeah, absolutely. So over the next few weeks, as we move into that recovery phase, we'll be focusing far more on what we want the economy to look like um, at all stages um, um, on the other side of the crisis. And, and in my portfolio, uh, you know, I'm focused very much on supporting our fintech and regtech ecosystems, everybody from sort of the pre-revenue stage right through to, to exporters. And you know, my role is to be the advocate for the sector in the ministry and continue to ensure that that the sector receives uh, the support that you need to keep growing and to keep your teams in jobs. Um, and as always, my my door is very very much open to you. And 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 I think that the Red Tech Association have been terrific in um, their contribution to shaping our emergency response, and will continue to be so. I should mention that for those that don't qualify for JobKeeper, there are other measures that are available 
to them. You know, not everyone will apply. Will you know? Will be able to receive the JobKeeper payments. And um, you know, there are some organisations, particularly those that are in pre-revenue, that might not qualify. But they they do have more flexibility in things like their their fixed costs, and they might be better placed because of those the flexibility in their fixed costs to weather the storm. Um, but there are things like the PAYG cash boost, uh, up to twenty thousand uh, dollars per month for for those that might not qualify for JobKeeper. There's a government guaranteed credit facility of for low interest loans up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for those that might want to move in that direction. There's a four month deferral of PAYG and SBT. There's instant asset write-off and accelerated depreciation for anybody that's investing in, um, in in assets in their businesses. There's things like assistance from ASIC, um, and that includes waivers and deferrals of, of their regulatory fees. And also some of the states have announced some further assistance with things like payroll tax waivers. And I think that, you know, that is a, a recognition that startups um, and that includes fintech and the reg tech space are going to be a really important part of um, the recovery phase, and we want to make sure that they are supported in as many ways as possible. And, and going back to that question of how you see them being an important part of that recovery phase, are there areas where you see reg tech playing a greater role? Oh yes, I mean there's some you know some of the government's initiatives that um, that we've been focusing on. You know they were priorities before the crisis. Um, you know, I've been working on uh, developing a range of initiatives to to boost the fintech, fintech and regtech investment and, and skills and and both and adoption too. Um, whether it be through uh, the, the effectiveness of the of the regulatory system, um, I, I mean, hand on heart, some of those initiatives have been delayed. We just we couldn't help that the the COVID nineteen crisis has taken up so much. Of um, our regulatory, of, of our legislative agenda, of Treasury's policy making, um, you know, capacity. So some of the things have have been delayed, but they haven't been delayed for forever. In coming weeks, as we shift to that recovery phase, it will become more important than ever, I think, to have you know the right policy settings in place to get capital markets moving again and help our companies grow. And if you look at things like, um, uh, you know say the CDR. So we've been pressing on with the implementation of the consumer data right, which I think is one of the most exciting and um, uh, game changing, gosh, I hate the phrase, but it really is, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a catalytic change in our financial services sector. And we're still on track to launch that on the 1st of July because, and, and, and quite frankly, the timing couldn't be better because there's never been a, a more important time, I think, to empower customers and to boost competition in our financial services sector. You know, at this time of um, extraordinary financial stress, we've seen more people than ever um, wanting to make changes to their financial their financial affairs, whether it be you know switching mortgages or refinancing a mortgage or um, you know switching their investments from aggressive investments to conservative investments. Um, changing their risk appetite along the way, or um, looking at new credit and savings products. And the CDR, of course, will provide Australians with the data that they need to make the decisions that uh, in, in, in making those changes and authorise uh, secure access to, to their data by accredited third parties. Um, and it allows secure um, consumers to get a, a much better deal, to shop around for a better deal, find a really tailored product offering that's, that's just right for them. Um, and at that time when we're talking about uh, that renewed focus on data security, I think that that is particularly important for the reg tech industry. You know, the CDR framework includes very much more strengthened protections than we've ever really seen before um, uh, so that consumers, I mean, they need to be confident when they're using open banking for the first time that if should they choose to share their data, that uh, it will be kept safe and not misused. So even before the CDR's launch, we're looking to the future. There's, we're examining at the moment just how um, uh, CDR could potentially use write access, for instance, and that's going to be a major, major step forward. 
um, and it will be catalyst for innovation in many areas, but in particular, I think in reg tech here, because it will require us to consider a range of options, uh, a range of issues like cybersecurity, like um, consent standards, and, uh, and of course, the ethical use of, of AI as well. So anybody that's out there that's interested in this, Scott Farrell is, is doing that CDR 2.0, for want of a better expression. It's a, an inquiry um, into the future of, of CDR, which if, you, if you're interested, please, we'd love you to participate and contribute to that. We've extended the deadline to the 21st of May, if I remember rightly. Harry will correct me if I'm wrong. The 21st of May to ensure that everybody has a chance to contribute to that. And you talked about capital markets. I mean, a couple of, of key, very specific things that affect reg tech. You, you would have known that in the RTA submission to the Senate inquiry, it showed that procurement and lack of capital are really still the greatest blockers to reg tech. 70% of founders are self-funded. And if capital's always been a problem, it's now likely to be an even bigger problem. So how can the government help in terms of capital and in terms of procurement? And if I can put to you the proposal again in that uh, Senate submission that a percentage of the fines through breaches of uh, regula regulations in the financial sector should go to setting up a patient capital fund to try and, you know, help the technology get developed to stop the breaches in the first place. I think you're right, Ali. You know, there's a there's a, a real need for um, you know a flourishing source of capital behind reg tech and fintech opportunities, and we know that there are a lot of you know pools, investment pools, whether they be direct investment um, or uh, you know managed investments or even potentially superannuation investments that are looking at fintech and reg tech opportunities. What about a government? The last part is providing scale. Well, look, there's some government opportunities too. You know. Um, as part of the COVID-19 responses, I think that you're finding appropriate flow, ensuring that there's been appropriate flow of credit available to um, small and medium enterprises has been particularly important. But I think that really where you're focusing is, is more on this government procurement issue. And I think that that's something that we've been particularly passionate about and have been a great advocate for. I think that you know, when it comes to uh, reg tech and, and actually tech more broadly, um, you know, government has a really important role to play as, as a customer, um, not just a facilitator. So, for example, we've provided ASIC with um, six million dollars to explore its own adoption of reg tech. And ASIC does these, and I know that there's probably a number of participants on the on the webinar today that have already participated in the ASIC showcases. And look, those showcases are really important because, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a matter of sort of leading by example, if you like. It, it, red tech adoption will be much more likely among the financial services industry if they can, if we can demonstrate that government and regulators have already started that process. Um, but most importantly, I think, from Massic's perspective, it ensures that uh, the regulatory enforcement is kept up to date, which is, you know, from a government perspective, so fundamental. So moving into that COVID-19 recovery phase, we'll be looking very carefully at just other ways that government can potentially engage further with the ecosystem. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's quite extraordinary. I didn't realise the extent of it until I started investigating, but the government is actually one of the largest procurers, procurers um, of goods and services in the national market. Um, Stuart Robert, my colleague, and I have been working, he's the Minister for Government Services. We've been working quite closely on some of this to improve access to um, uh, the best and the most innovative services in the market. But the priority, I think, for us is to, is to streamline those procurement processes, um, making it easier for uh, for you um, um, to to bid for government contracts, so that we can get the best and the and the brightest in the market. Um, you know, it's funny. You know, Minister Robert he, 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 and the Digital Transformation Agency. I think that they've done a very very good job in enhancing the digital marketplace already. Um, the digital marketplace is uh, is bringing government tech procurement together onto just one simple online platform and uh, and it allows that all companies that include startups and include scale-ups can access government contracts 
It's been awarded uh, over, it's already awarded around a billion dollars in contracts uh, and, uh, and about 70% of those have gone to small and medium enterprises. So, and, and about half of it, I should say too, um, of that billion dollars, around 650 million, uh, was awarded just in the last 12 months alone. So over the coming months, I think you can expect to see that escalate further. Senator, we, we need to get to our three reg checks, but if I can just ask you incredibly briefly to about the issue of safe harbour, because if we're talking about uh, trying to encourage the take up of reg tech, what is the government's appetite to look at safe harbour, both prospective and retrospective, and to address that issue of risk penalty for the early adopters? Yeah, look, I know this is something that uh, has come up at Andrew Bragg's um, uh, uh, the, the Senate inquiry. And look, can I, do, can I say um, on, just on that inquiry in particular, that's been extended for another six months. I'm actually, I'm not entirely sure that's public yet. <laughs> I'm not sure whether it's announced it, but the FinTech and RegTech inquiry has been extended for another six months, which I think is really important because it gives us a fantastic opportunity to, to you know, build a, you know, so a database of knowledge from different parts of the industry. And it's not just Andrew Bragg, obviously, there are a number of senators that are on that committee uh, from my side of politics, you know, Susan McDonald and, and Paul Scar, but also from the opposition and, and from the crossbench, you know, you've got um, uh, Mariel Smith is the deputy chair, and then you've also got Jess Wilson and, and Rex Patrick. So what this does is gives us an opportunity to air those sorts of concerns, things like safe harbour that might find some pushback in various parts of, of the government and, um, you know, shine a spotlight on the issues for a particular sector like fintech, like regtech. Uh, so, you know, I'd encourage people to, you know, keep contributing to those to that committee because it does allow for a level of bipartisanship when we do make those changes. As far as safe harbour goes, I, I can't give you a definitive answer just yet, Ali. It's, uh, as I said, you know, nothing is off the table in the recovery. We want to see this sector flourish. We know that we need reg tech um, to create that high growth economy that we're going to need to 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 pull us out of uh, to pull us out of the you know post COVID um, situation. You know we've got two choices when it comes to the you know, the um, inevitable. I hate using the word. We're not allowed to use it. I think in public recession that we we're inevitably going to face here. We can tax our way out of it or we can grow our way out of it. And the only way we can grow our way out of it is to do so efficiently. And that's why we need technology, we need fintech and we need regtech to build the foundation stones behind that recovery. So there, I think you'll find that the Prime Minister is right behind this sector and will be very open-minded about changes that are required in the future. That said, I'm not going to commit to you right now on Safe Harbour. All right. Senator Hume, thank you. We will come back to you with audience questions. But at this point, I'd just like to uh, go to the first of our three reg techs for their perspectives on COVID-19 challenges and opportunities. And if I can ask Guy Harrison, the founder and CTO of Proven DB, to go first. Welcome, Guy. Hi, thanks, Ali. And thank you, Senator Hume, for your attendance. That was um, very interesting. Um, so uh, I'm the founder and CTO of ProvenDB, and we're a, a, a high trust database platform. Um, I'd like to start by just um, uh, just reminding everyone that the digital technology has created a sort of like an amazing advance in our ability to process and maintain information. Each of us today and the four billion humans connected to the internet have more access to information than anyone from the previous generation. But it hasn't come without any cost. Digital information is very easy to copy, amend and fabricate. And this is sort of one of the factors that's um, contributing to an erosion of trust in society and in business. We all sort of see this through fake news and in the real news, we see constant reports of document tampering from royal commissions and elsewhere. And aside from anything else, all of this digital tampering and fabrication creates a burden on honest enterprises who are trying to prove their compliance to legal and regulatory requirements. So ProvingDB is a data storage system that offers the power and functionality of the databases that power pretty much all of our information systems, but together with trust and data integrity that we get from blockchain technology. So when we add data to our data store, digital signatures are, pardon me, digital signatures are created, posted to a mutual public blockchain, and these signatures prove the integrity, ownership and creation of all the information, making it impossible to tamper with that data 
or to fabricate the data after the fact. And proving to be compliance fault is our turnkey solution for businesses of all size that use this technology to provide a sort of tamper-proof and trustworthy store for all of your compliance information so that you can easily sort of expedite audits, you can show transparency of all your alterations and basically meet all of the APRA and other guidelines for um, data risk. So um, our, we're a relatively young startup. Um, our timing was sort of terrible in a way. We launched our commercial service in January. Um, in February, we signed our first customer up and we had significant POCs here and around the world. And of course, you know, like everyone, we saw a lot of those opportunities received um, with the COVID um, pandemic. Um, and so we're seeing our revenue outlook significantly delayed. And we're in that category that Senator Hume spoke about before, we're pre-revenue. So we're not eligible for JobKeeper, although we, we do appreciate the other, um, the other benefits like the cash flow boost that the, the government's given. But still, I'm concerned generally that pre-revenue startups, which is where a lot of Australia's sort of innovation capital resides, um, are particularly vulnerable during this time. And if we do believe that um, innovation is going to be an important part of our recovery, then I think uh, um, I think the sector should continue to sort of like think about how we can say nurture that um, nurture that early stage innovation. Um, as far as where we see our role in recovery, um, it, it's obviously a long road to recovery, and I think we all recognise that the economy of the future is going to look different from the economy of the past. This isn't sort of like a return to um, the exact situation we were in a few months ago. Um, from a technology standpoint, um, we foresee a lot more emphasis on security. The, the movement to working from home has created a lot of vulnerability to systems. Companies just weren't really ready in many cases to securely give people remote access and those companies are now vulnerable. Um, a lot of companies have had to lift and shift in sort of a hurry into cloud and other elastic environments, and that's another vulnerability. And obviously, um, the economic downturn provides a sort of like a motivation for bad behaviour and crime. And we also think that there's um, likely to be an increased emphasis on accurate information going forward. We already see the, the need to make sure that people have correct information about COVID and other, other matters. And so I'd like to think that we can help with that by providing an inherently trustable platform for data and being able to, in a security context, be able to be sure that data hasn't been tampered with um, or in otherwise um, accessed without um, appropriate authorization. Um, I did have a question for the Senator and it's um, been covered somewhat by the, um, by the early discussion, but I would note that the government came out with their national blockchain roadmap um, earlier this year, just before COVID really started to bite. And, um, and I'm interested if this, and I know the Senator's um, office was involved a lot in that roadmap, especially the KYC use cases. And so I'm interested in how you see blockchain specifically and high technologies generally um, playing a role in recovery. I know that you've, you've just indicated you see, if anything, an acceleration of technology as as a sort of an, um, a facilitator of recovery. But I wonder if you've got some more sort of thoughts on that and how specifically the tech industry could help in terms of sort of like participating in that recovery. Thanks very much. Senator Hume. Yeah, well, can I just start by saying, Guy, you're absolutely right. I'm a bit of a, you know, a blockchain groupie. So, um, you know, forgive me on that one. But that was actually how my first introduction really to FinTech. And if you'll just indulge me for a moment, Believe it or not, it was Sam Dastiari that got me into fintech. He set up a group called the Parliamentary Friendship Group for Blockchain, which requires um, somebody from each side of the parliament to sort of co-sponsor a parliamentary friendship group, which allows the industry to, to, to come into parliament and, and, and get a hearing. And, uh, and Sam was the one that approached me some time ago and said, hey, listen, you know, I'd like to do this one for blockchain. You know, you've come from financial services. This might be appropriate for you. And when we launched it, we were just inundated with interest. It was you know, quite extraordinary. And, and so that was really then that really sort of, you know, started my, my, my fintech obsession. You know, I agree with you guys. I think that blockchain techno technology offers, um, you know, opportunities right across the economy that 
the idea of um, an, an immutable source of truth, I think, is really exciting in this age of, as, as you said, you know, fake news and misinformation and mistrust too. Um, you know, uh, there's a prediction um, that within a couple of years that blockchain will support um, the global movement and tracking of around two trillion US dollars worth of um, uh, goods and um, and services annually, uh, just using that sort of um, uh, the, the the provenance component of, of blockchain, which I think is really exciting. And in, and in my portfolio, there's such an enormous option uh, opportunity to use blockchain applications in fintech um, and regtech too, particularly when it comes to managing those very complex databases and KYC as you manage as well. And of course, you know, the best example of that I think is right now, um, you know, the ASX is preparing to launch its blockchain based uh, clearing settlement platform. Um, and that will cut out an enormous amount of time and, and cost and, and redundant uh, resources compared to the old legacy chess system, which I can remember learning about as cutting edge technology when I was at university. And, while I'd like to say that was recently, it really wasn't. So um, the blockchain roadmap itself has come out of Minister Andrew's office, um, and and uh, and as as Karen has says, Minister Andrews has said um, that KYC technology is um, just you know one of the really exciting opportunities there to allow for you know, better assurance of data and and, and much lower costs. I think that. It's important to say that our general approach to fintech and regtech is that we are technology agnostic. We we don't want to push a particular platform um, as when you know, one can produce a better outcome over another, and that, you know, we don't want to set up unnecessary barriers to to any use of a particular technology either. Um, but I think that the cost and the time savings of of, te of blockchain technology and the potential for that to you know delivery in the market is is really exciting and that's why um, um, you know I got involved in the first place and why Karen Andrews has um, uh, delivered that blockchain roadmap and and there is a, a steering committee uh, on that blockchain roadmap that will oversee strategies arising from it which and I think the most important part of that is the, the collaboration between industry uh, and academia and government something that um, Australia has actually been really good at uh, in the past. Um, and so I think that's where probably the opportunities will, will lie in the future. That was a very long-winded answer to your question, Guy, but I think you, you got me on a hobby horse there. Sorry. And it won't fall victim, Senator, to, as other measures are likely to at least be delayed by COVID-19? Well, I think that it's hard to say uh, that, I, mean, look, I think, as I, as I said earlier, about... You know, 80% of the Treasury agenda at the moment is taken up with COVID-19 responses. It was Hain Royal Commission before that. And that stuff has been, you know, certainly, you know, well, we haven't announced it yet. I think I've just broken the news on air to this webinar. But, you know, that there will be some delays to, to those to those Hain Royal Commission recommendations, implementation. And inevitably, you know, each portfolio has had to reprioritise things for COVID-19 I don't want to preempt what's coming out of the industry innovation and science portfolio from Karen Andrews' perspective, but I do know that obviously there is so much in her portfolio that is going to be so important to building the recovery. As a journalist, I just have to ask you that question. Is there anything in particular you can point to about the Hain Royal Commission recommendations that are likely to be delayed that will affect the reg tech sector that they ought to know about? No, uh, look, probably not. I think it's more, look, yes, maybe indirectly through things like financial advice. Um, you know, there were a lot of Hain Royal Commission recommendations that were involved in, evolved, revolved around financial advice and some of those um, recommendations and the way we implement them will be delayed sometime. I can't tell you exactly what time because that's not my prerogative, that's the Treasurer's prerogative. I was kind of hoping he might have done that announcement before we got to, to the webinar today, but um, he hasn't yet, so I don't want to preempt him. I think he's a little bit busy. <laughs> he's a little bit busy. And look, if I can welcome now uh, Lisa Schutz to talk to us. She's the founder and CEO of Verify. Lisa, over to you. Uh, hi there. Um, can you hear me now? 
Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Hi, Minister Hume and, and Ali, thank you. And thank you to the RegTech Association for this forum. Um, yeah, so Verify, we're at um, a, a slightly progressed stage. Um, we're more in the scale up end of things. Um, so we are essentially all about um, frictionless and fair, responsible lending. And we do that by um, effectively giving people their data back. I mean, I'm obviously, uh, as many know, a massive fan of CDR. Um, and I, um, but prior to that, we've actually been doing consumer driven data sharing through privacy principle 12. So really excited about this. And I agree, it's an absolutely step change and will empower people in ways we, we, we can only just begin to imagine. So um, pre COVID, we were powering on in scale up mode um, and delivering on our responsible lending toolkit, which is in frictionless income verification, new age or new breed expense verification benchmarks and financial wellbeing indices with the Melbourne Institute. So the idea was a holistic package around giving customers um, great pastoral care throughout the life of their loan and meeting the obligations of responsible lending. So that's what we were doing. And then like the rest of us, we all got sideswiped um, with COVID. And, and yeah, we've certainly had the, the excitement of all of the things that have been discussed today. We had, we, we were just coming out of, um, from our point of view, it's very hard as a reg tech when there's regulatory uncertainty. So we had really had quite a stall the prior year with um, the Royal Commission findings and what that was going to do and RG209 from an ASIC point of view, and that had all just cleared up. Um, and so we were just powering. Uh, we had to get through Christmas. As my head of sales said, we got through all the uncertainties with the regulations. We got through Christmas. We got through the bushfires. <laughs> and then we experienced COVID. Um, but it's had a funny, strange, twisted effect in the sense that on the one hand, we've had our sales pipeline kind of grind to a halt as head offices scramble to, to work out things, how to handle it. Do you know, the funny thing is it's also, of course, accelerated demand for what we do. And we've actually had some really amazing direct client feedback, people saying, thank God we implemented your tools because with our um, call centres, you know, offline, you're the only reason we can process applications. So that kind of is really heartening. Um, and obviously, well, not obviously, but we were just poised for a funding round in June to, to accelerate our growth. And of course, we're, that's not gonna happen. So look, we, we really, you know, I guess we're in that, you know, delicate scale up phase, but it was funny. We, we sat there and we thought, well, okay, wh what's going on? We, we love to solve problems. And all of our clients were saying to us, we can't possibly onboard you right this second because we're too busy dealing with a wall of hardship applications and and that historically it turns out has been 100% manual. It is historically, you know, you might have 0.1% of the borrowing population in any month, you know, dealing with those processes. Uh, and now, you know, everyone's experiencing 20 to 50 times spike in volume. So what we ended up doing is in, in incredibly <laughs> it's hard to actually believe how quickly this has happened, but we've retooled our toolkit and within three weeks we were live automating hardship applications for one of our customers. So it's, it's I would I'd say um, we've probably created a new line of business. I think I've pretty much exhausted my entire team <laughs> and myself. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the appreciation would be, from our point of view, we do exhibit those classic things you're talking about. So for us, you know, the um, pay-as-you-go relief's been really good. JobKeeper, those changes made it possible for us to access, so that's been really good. Um, the debt funding has just been a, a nightmare for us. That's just because I don't think um, anyone's set up to lend to this kind of point in the cycle. And the directors' um, liabilities are really difficult when you've got a small number of directors who are borrowing on behalf of a larger shareholder base, so that's all tricky. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that's where we're at. I mean, I guess I, I did have one question, obviously, with the CDR hat on. Um, I, I'm really interested in your perspectives, Jane, on this issue of super and timelines on that. Um, yeah. And your thought on, from a policy point of view, what the real driver is, because from my point of view, I think what Verify has been really keen on is using data from one area 
to generate insights for another. And I keep thinking that, well, uh, the, the, the nudges that you could give people, like, so for instance, you know, when you change your beneficiary in super, does anyone ever ask you if you should change your will? You know, things mm. like that. Interesting. That's fascinating. Um, Ali, am I allowed to look? Absolutely. Yes, please. All right, fantastic. Can I, can I just, you know, first point out that, um, you know, I've known Lisa, I think, for, and this is really embarrassing, Lisa, I would put it on about 40 years. Is that right? Which yep. is amazing, considering both of us are clearly only 35. Correct. You must have gone to primary school Three together. <laughs> we actually did, believe it or not. So, yes, so Lisa and I have known each other for very for a really long time, which is why I find it really weird when she calls me Minister Hume. It just doesn't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> but how good is it to work with, to see somebody that, you know, I've grown up with being so successful in, in, in this sector? It's really you know, heartening to see. Um, can I also say I know, Lisa, that the, the, the issue that, that, um, that Ali brought up before on Safe Harbour, that was all you, girl. That was <laughs> you that brought that up in the uh, Senate inquiry. So I know what's going on here. You guys are coll you're colluding, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> Can I, 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 I suppose on this issue of super, which I find really exciting, you know, that's my happy place is superannuation. I've worked in there, you know, for so much of my career. Seeing the CDR and how the CDR might apply to super is really exciting. Now, that is a long time down the track. Don't get me wrong. We've got to get through mm -hmm. open banking, first of all. We've got to get through CDR 2.0. Um, it's going to be extended to energy before it gets extended anywhere else, then to telecommunications. And then the Prime Minister's priorities there are insurance and then superannuation. But, yeah, you're right. They're the sort of things that I'm looking at too is how do we see, because at the moment we're talking in, in silos in, in CDR, but the cross-pollination between data um, you know, you know, from those silos, I think that is really exciting stuff. And, um, and of course, you know, your, your position, you, you know, your, your, um, your, you know, your company's uh, specialisation has a, an awful lot of application across all sectors in the CDR, not just banking, not just superannuation. You know, there's um, incredible opportunities there for the reg techs to sort of plug and play into CDR in ways that we haven't really thought of yet. You know, when I talk about CDR, I, I liken it, and, and you know, I really am only focusing on just the banking side of things at the moment, but I liken it to, um, you know, a smartphone. We'll look back in 10 years' time on the way that we used to bank, and it'll be like the difference between having a smartphone and having a Nokia flip phone. You know, at the time, we thought Nokia flip phone's really cool. You can make calls. You can even text. This texting stuff's really modern. But now, how do you live without a smartphone? And that's what the CDR is going to be. It is going to be genuinely transformative. And, you know, hey, I'm so glad there are people like you out there that have the imagination to be able to leverage off that infrastructure. I mean, government can provide the infrastructure, but it's, it's the private sector and people like you that, you know, have the imagination to be able to, you know, take it to the next level to make that consumer experience so much better and not just the experience but also the outcomes. And so, yeah, I, I'm really excited by that. Thank you, Minister. I'd just like to invite the audience. I'm very aware of time and we are going to run out of time. But if you do want to uh, ask a question of the Minister, I'll do my best to squeeze in at least one or two. Uh, so I'll, I'm giving you a little bit of warning before um, before we go to those questions. So I'd like to invite our, our final uh, reg tech uh, business to give us a, a perspective on how they're coping with the current crisis. Ben Hobby, the CEO of iTree. If I can hand over to you, Ben. Yeah, thank you so much, Ali, and uh, thank you, Minister. Um, I think you're both just fabulous, so great examples uh, to us and love your energy. Um, I apologise up front, Minister, if I give a different uh, or slightly different perspective in RegTech than just financial. Um, iTree is a RegTech that was a startup uh, really in, in a cupboard uh, under the stairs at the University of Wollongong uh, back in 1996. So we're you know, almost coming up for our 25th year. And we began um, in the safety, you know, security and sustainability uh, solutions business uh, for transport. And over 24 years, uh, we've broadened our expertise into other domains. 
So vital regulatory spaces uh, that cover compliance, uh, enforcement and safety um, in the regulatory space. So domains such as liquor and gambling, transport security, uh, maritime, primary industries, biosecurity, uh, fisheries and even into child safety. Uh, we determined a long time ago that we wanted to remain as a regional headquarter business and to grow the IT jobs as a sector and an expertise somewhere other than a mainstream city. And so uh, we find ourselves today uh, still remaining in Wollongong um, and our entire uh, customer base are government agencies within uh, Australian states and territories, uh, the federal government and also national agencies uh, across New Zealand. So we're not a startup. Uh, we're definitely into a scale up mode. Um, we've got almost 100 people uh, based in Wollongong. So uh, what happened to us uh, when this virus uh, suddenly arrived? We had to adopt a mantra um, that we shouldn't let anything get in the way of us delivering for government because they need us you know, more than ever you know, right now. Yep. And our goal was to not lose a single job you know, due to the virus. Um, so far, so good. And um, it hasn't affected us uh, in that way um, so far. Um, our initial challenge, though, because of what we do in the reg tech space being you know, highly critical um, for the safety, really, of all Australians. We're running systems and platforms for uh, government agencies and regulation that keep us all safe on the roads and the waters, you know, all around us in the community, uh, right through to, to child safety. And we know that just because of the circumstances of COVID-19, there's been significant increases in potential, you know, threatening areas. So we managed to, to maintain a consistency the challenge for us has been around doing a highly technical and complex uh, type of role for government um, with information that's highly sensitive and very confidential. Trying to take 100 people and within the flip of a switch saying, you're now not working together, you're completely working um, apart from each other and working remotely um, has been a, a huge challenge uh, for us. Now you've, you've got technology to use like cloud solutions, et cetera, but when you're dealing with um, you know, really high scale, um, high availability type solutions for government, um, you can't just flip switches and expect everything to work how it did yesterday, uh, tomorrow. We managed to, I think, um, you know, deal with that you know, initial uh, challenge. Um, and I think, um, one of the challenges going forward as we look to towards recovery, you know, now is going to be how we keep up the pace. Um, I think the government has do actually done a phenomenal job um, of the short term um, aspects of keeping people going and, and keeping afloat. I think um, that's been extraordinary, actually. And what's going to be vital for the recovery for Australia's economy, particularly, as you've mentioned, is the support for homegrown brands, uh, which you know, really leads to the question that uh, somewhat you've spoken about, but I guess how will the government accelerate the adoption of RegTech from Australian technology brands that it might be either in a startup or in a scale up mode? I think one thing that the, the paper from RTA has called out is that we really do a good job in this space. It's one of our highest potential um, export propositions, and I think has a, a really huge contribution to make in terms of economic recovery. Thank you. Minister, can I ask you whether you'd like to address that issue of just, I, I guess we've talked about a little, but how you do accelerate the adoption of homegrown reg tech? Yeah, well, I think we've spoken about it a little bit before mm. with things like government procurement, with things like, um, you know, the, the Australia-UK FinTech bridge is a good start and potentially extending that bridge to other jurisdictions like Singapore that has a real appetite for Australian FinTech and RegTech. So, um, you know, we are trying to find those opportunities. You know, for us, we've been looking at 
um, organisations, you know, like yours, Ben, but, you know, we start with, you know, the pre-revenues, we move to, you know, post-revenue, and then we go to exporters and, you know, successful companies just like yours. And I, can I tell you that there has been a very common refrain, um, you know, the, the, the difficulties that there has been in that, you know, transitioning to a new working environment and then still delivering the services that you've committed to, that is very, very common. We're hearing that not just from fintech and regtech, but from, you know, all all sectors of, of the economy. Um, can, I first, can I say thank you too for um, uh, acknowledging the, just the sheer volume of work that has gone into the uh, COVID-19 economic response. From our perspective, from, from the Treasury team's perspective, it was the equivalent of putting together about three budgets in four weeks, which is, you know, exhausting. And what I've been thrilled about is uh, the extent to which our agencies, whether it be the ATO and the regulators, APRA, ASIC, um, as well as the private sector, have really come together and said, right, we, it's time to row in the same direction. And when I say, um, I, you know, I should actually at this, at this point too acknowledge, uh, you know, the opposition as well. You know, there were, we're, there's always going to be little niggles with the opposition, but wow, on the, on the whole, the bipartisan support for the changes that have been made to help support the Australian economy have been just exceptional during this period of time. Um, uh, I'd, I'd like to say that we can do more. I'm, I think you should be really proud, Ben, of the origins you were, of your organisation. You know, hey, Harry Potter started, started in a cupboard under the stairs as well somewhere, so he was pretty successful in the end. So I reckon that you've got an awful lot of potential ahead of you. I'd love to take the conversation with you offline and we can potentially talk to you about you know what it is that you are looking for from from government now to 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 to, to make that leap to the post covid economy that would be terrific yeah i'd love to thank you minister thanks yeah and Minister, it's, it's nice to finish always with a silver lining and, and maybe that's it, that if there are challenges in working remotely, there's also going to be a rethink for many businesses post-COVID to how they operate. So maybe that's the perfect environment for them to think a bit more about uh, taking on board a bit more reg tech than they have in the past. Let's take that as a silver lining. Exactly. I think that's terrific. You know, there will be some good stories to come out of this. There have been lots of learnings for businesses and those businesses that have learned how to adapt and, um, and transform in, in, this, in, in a trying time will come out of this really well. I can't promise that all businesses will survive. And, you know, that's something that breaks my heart. But, um, you know, that's what happens in, in crises, whether they be caused by health or whether they be caused by, um, you know, markets or, or any other reason. You know, businesses fail. But good business, businesses that can adapt um, quickly and appropriately and, and have one eye um, on their people and another eye on opportunities uh, will be the ones that survive. Our job is to make sure that we provide as much of a safety net as possible. And that's why we've focused on not just supporting households, but supporting businesses and particularly trying to keep that connection between businesses and their employees so that when we get to the other side of the health crisis, there is an economy that can be restarted, rebooted, and hopefully is in a position where it can flourish and thrive even better than it had been before because it's learnt new things. Senator Hume, thank you very much for your time and for your insights. Thanks, Ali. Thank you very much to Senator Hume. And I'd now like to introduce someone who you all are incredibly familiar with, of course, Deborah Young, who is the founding CEO of the RTA, to launch the RTA strategy for 2022. Over to you, Deborah. Uh, thank you, Ali. Um, and thanks very much uh, to Senator Hume and, um, and Ben, Lisa and Guy for their insights. I thought it was really, really important today Jane, to um, for you to hear directly from some of the reg tech firms about their challenges and you know how they are seeing the recovery, um, because I think all of that will help you, um, you know, to do your job. And um, just in recognition of that, I did want to thank both um, both you and Harry for the very authentic way that you've been, um, you know, being connected with us over the last um, uh, over the last six or seven weeks throughout this uh, crisis. Um, you know, having such a widespread impact on everybody around us. So I, I wanted to um, uh, acknowledge you for that. So 
um, thank you very much. Um, you know, what's really incredible is over the last um, seven weeks, we've had 1,100 people um, register uh, for these sessions, over 19 countries and over 400 companies come together. Um, and so this is really, um, the association is really now attracting a global audience. And in fact, today, we've got lots of people on the line um, from the UK and the US. Um, so that was really great. Um, Really great to see. And I'd like to acknowledge Ali Moore. Thank you very much um, for facilitating for us today. Um, so a couple of months ago, the board and I it was in February, in fact, and it was before this whole thing uh, kind of unfolded. We sat down uh, to develop our um, two year uh, reg tech strategy uh, roadmap. And this was really a roadmap written so that we can help reg tech su succeed. And be um, and be deployed over a reduced uh, time frame would be ideal. Um, and 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 that's all in aid of getting the help to the regulated um, entities, um, uh, um, you know, to help their compliance and to help their regulatory processes, and so that they can benefit from that. Um, so, uh, you know, we we were founded in Australia, but we are now radiating globally, and we have a unique opportunity due to the robust regulatory regime and our reputation to bring everybody together under this umbrella of a centre of excellence. And so it was with, with all of that backdrop that, we, um, that we've that we developed um, some new strategies. Um, and we'll formally be announcing a new advisory committee as well who, who are going to help us or, and help the board uh, help deliver those strategies. And we'll make a formal announcement in the next couple of days. So we started with three key strategies and a fourth one crept in that you uh, might've heard of called COVID-19. So I'd like to start now um, with talking about um, navigating the COVID-19 crisis with heart. Now, what that means to us is being completely available and being very authentic and taking lots of phone calls, providing support and tools for our members and the wider ecosystem as they navigate this crisis. Um, we've eliminated all program fees, so nobody has to pay to attend any of our events um, at the moment. And I'm pleased to announce that the next financial year, we will be reducing membership fees for the upcoming uh, 2021 financial year to recognise the financial strain and burden on many uh, companies out there. Um, the uh, second strategy is around advocating for the value of RegTech. Now, there are no surprises here. Of course, this is what we do is our um, meat and vegetables. Um, but our audience just got bigger and it got wider and it got more global. And so this is, we are so uniquely um, positioned right at the moment. So we've created some new membership categories and we want to seek um, strategic alliances with uh, peak bodies and global organisations. And, and in particular, we're looking at the government starting here in Australia to to talk about the widespread economic benefit. And we've heard a little bit about that today, that uh, whilst financial services still makes up the majority, um, the reg techs are serv serving uh, financial services, uh, there are many other regulated industry verticals that could benefit and we want to educate around that. Um, the global borders I'm seeing from where we are sitting right at the moment are really melting away and commonalities are emerging as the global community comes together to get to this point of trust and I really think that the association can play an important role there. Um, the third strategy is around um, expanding um, markets and exports. Um, every reg tech knows that we are playing um, a, a game of scale and we need to get to that scale. And to do that, we need to look at new markets and we need to look at global markets. So we'll continue to advocate um, for reg tech roadmaps to be written into export programs and government export programs. Um, have the wider ecosystem understand that RegTech is is not actually the little sister of FinTech. It's actually a big, bright and vibrant uh, enabling range of technologies that can help organisations um, get to better compliance. And we'll continue to expand and work on our partnerships with global trade agencies, some of who are on the, on the line today, to facilitate increased um, commerce in, in their areas. Um, we also want to explore new market segments that can benefit from reg tech, including government as a buyer, which we've heard a little bit about today as well. And we'll be working with some partners on research programs that will help us work on the markets that, that are low hanging fruit, that will give us that scale and have the greatest need um, right now. 
And then finally, um, it's something that we've talked about today as well, and that's um, facilitating investment opportunities. Before the COVID crisis, um, there was another crisis called the capital crisis, and, and we've touched on that, and it was in our submission. But 70% of our RegTech members are bootstrapped or self-funded. Um, and so we want to continue to talk uh, to the Senate Select Committee around some of these things around a patient capital fund and some other ideas that we put on the table so that um, we can get capital flowing into this uh, sector. And importantly, at this time, supporting the regulated entities themselves uh, and regulatory agencies to buy this technology and facilitate um, that process. Um, so three years ago, um, RegTech Association um, was a vision and it was exec executed, uh, that vision was executed by uh, a small handful of passionate RegTechs. And today here we are 150 organisations becoming more of a global force um, and helping the understanding of RegTech engaging with regulators and helping people from the entire ecosystem to connect to do business, accelerate adoption and to bring um, trust about. Um, so they are really the, the four, um, they're the four strategies there. Um, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to stay on the line and, and listen to those. We'll be launching these more formally um, over the coming week and please connect, um, please connect with us um, we want to hear your thoughts around those and your ideas. Being a small organisation, we can be nimble and we can um, we can push things out to market um, pretty quickly. Um, and, uh, Jane, I, I'd love, um, you know, for us to obviously stay in uh, close connection around, um, around some of these core objectives that we have over the next um, uh, two years. Um, and I wanted to formally thank you once again for your time. Um, and uh, finally, you can see a slide up there which um, uh, gives an idea of the next uh, couple of events that we have coming up. And given that everything is virtual, they are actually much easier for us to turn around and push out. So thank you to everybody that's attending those. Uh, as Ali said earlier, recording is being made and we will be sending out a survey shortly. Um, uh, Jane, perhaps I ask you, do you have a, a final, a final um, a comment that you'd like to make before we sign off for the day? Deborah, other than to say that, you know, I suppose if I can leave you with the message is that Australian fintech and regtech are very much open for business. And as your minister, I intend to ensure that the work that I do um, best supports your industry to compete on, on, a, on a world stage, not just in Australia. We remain focused on things like launching the CDR, um, something we didn't talk about today, but launching the regulatory sandbox through ASIC, growing the new payments platform, um, building on our international partnerships through things like the, you know, the FinTech bridge and, and, and expanding those bridges and, and much more. In the months ahead, I want to focus very much on boosting capital flows, on um, you know, regulatory engagement and also on international um, opportunities for the sector. And I'll be holding a, a series of forums and roundtables um, with companies and also with investors to get to make sure that you have the support you need. So I, I think that there can be no better signal to investors, both in Australia and abroad, that uh, the Morrison government's focus and confidence on our on our, on our, our fintech and, and regtech ecosystem. So thank you very much for your time today. It's a, it's a real pleasure. These forums are so important that we, so we can speak to each other directly uh, you know, during these times. Thank you very much, Deborah. Your engagement has been terrific. Thank you very much, Jane. All the best. Um, and uh, with that, I'll, I'll call the uh, event to conclude. Um, thanks very much. I'll stay on the line for a few seconds longer in case anybody wanted to have a chat with me. Thanks, Jane. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Hey, so Deborah. Excellent. Hello. How are you? Very well, thanks. That's good. This is this is the best part of these little webinars. It's the little.